So I've known Peter Cavana for about five years now. And not only has he won my heart with his quick British humor, but spending some time with him, I've realized that he has a depth and wealth of a revelation of Jesus in the scriptures. He has his diploma in theology and Greek texts, his master's of theology degree in Pentecostal and charismatic studies, and he's currently working on his doctorate in 1 Corinthians and spiritual gifts. He has some books. Uh, you can Google Peter Cavana, C-A-V-A-N-A, and you can find his works there. But what I really want to talk to you about is his YouTube channel. It's called Opening the Scriptures. And he goes through different books of the Bible in great depth with historical background and things. I have thoroughly enjoyed them, and I encourage you to check them out. But we're going to talk today about First and Second Thessalonians. And I am extremely excited about this just simply because of the depth that I know uh, Peter Cavana carries. So let's start off real simple. Who wrote these books? Okay. Well, there's nothing simple, is there? Nothing simple. Uh, of course, Paul is is the writer, but anyone reading First Thessalonians, looking at verse one, will see that Paul, as he often does, says that he is writing from himself and from Silas, and from Timothy. And so he is kind of writing from all of them. But of course, we understand that Paul is the writer. Um, it might be worth mentioning that right at the end of Second Thessalonians, Paul does what he sometimes does, which is he signs it in his own hand. And so right at the end of Second Thessalonians, I think it's the penultimate verse. He says something like, here I am writing in my own hand. And so it's almost like he's like signing it, which sort of tells us that someone else maybe did the actual writing as he was preaching it and dictating it. Uh, but yeah, Paul is most certainly the author, isn't he? Wow. Who, who are these Thessalonians? <laughs> the Thessalonians are uh, Greeks. So... You might remember that in Acts chapter 16, Paul is in Asia frustrated because it seems like he can't seem to find the will of God for what he's doing. He's not allowed to preach. He tries to cross into certain territories and he, the Spirit of God won't allow him to do so. And then he has this incredible vision. You remember this, this dream at night of the man from Macedonia, which is another territory. In fact, in fact, it's Europe, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And uh, so Paul makes plans to go to Macedonia. In fact, uh, just something that's a little bit of fun is that in the dream, uh, it's a man from Macedonia. Everyone talks about the man from Macedonia. Actually, when Paul gets there, his, co his first convert is a woman. And so maybe we shouldn't take all our visions as literally as even today, as literally oh. as we like to. But um, anyway, that's just a bit of fun. Paul heads for Macedonia. And uh, Paul has no other instructions than go to Macedonia, right? I mean, come and help us said the man. And um, so Paul just heads there and he doesn't seem to have any further direction from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was really good back in Asia at telling him what not to do. And sometimes that's the way that God can guide us, isn't it? Mm -hmm. By telling us what not to do. I mean, sometimes that's as valuable as knowing what we should do. Um, so when he gets there, he just heads for the big cities. So first he goes to Philippi, which is a leading city. Uh, Luke tells us he calls it a leading city, a protos city of Macedonia. And then he heads for the capital city, which is Thessalonica. So it's a bit like you, Eric, if you were called to, if the Lord spoke to you, I want you to come and preach in England, you might, you might head to London mm -hmm. uh, rather than to some small village or town, right? And uh, so Paul does, does the same thing. Thessalonica 
is the Greek uh, populace, about 200,000 people living there, which is a lot in those days. Oh. And, uh, and it's a Greek city near Mount Olympus, which was a sort of a heathen Greek worship center for the, for the Greek gods. And a lot of shrine prostitution and sexual immorality went on there, oh. which in time we will discover has its impact on the book. Tremendous. So why would he write this letter to those who live in Thessalonica is how you say it? I call it Thessalonica, but Thessalonica. I guess I always say when you don't know how to say something, I used to say this to my, all my Bible college students. If you don't know how to say a word, say it quickly and no one will mind. <laughs> Thessalonica. Thessalonica. So um, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, no, Paul, you may, you may remember that when Paul arrives in Thessalonica, we're in Acts 17 here in the early part of that, of that chapter. It says he preaches in the synagogues for three, three consecutive Sabbaths. He may have stayed there a little bit longer than that because in Philippians chapter 4, he uh, commends the uh, Thessalonians for sending him aid again and again, which might suggest that he was in Thessalonica longer than just the three weeks, but he did preach for three weeks in the synagogues. And then there is a riot. Um, there's all kinds of forms of evangelism, you know, and Paul seemed to specialize in riot evangelism, don't you think? He, pre he was involved in riot evangelism quite a lot. Was it Reinhard Bonke who once said, when Paul preached, they either got saved or they picked up stones, right? And so, there, and so there's a riot. You might know that old verse. Um, if I quote it in the King James, people know it better. These people who have turned the world upside down mm -hmm. have now come here. Wow. In the modern version, something like those who've caused trouble all over the world have come here. And so there is trouble in, in uh, Thessalonica, big, big trouble. He has a few converts there, some Jews and some, and some Greeks, which again will be relevant when we look at the letter. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is the, there's such trouble that the, that the new converts in Thessalonica decide that it's time for Paul to escape and they urge him to leave. And so it's mm -hmm. a very interesting story because Paul leaves an evangelistic mission, really, um, because there's too much persecution. Wow. So what happens is he heads to Athens. Well, he goes to Berea first. Then he goes to Athens. While he's in Athens, he's still worried about the uh, Thessalonians hmm. because he left them in a lot of trouble. And so he sends Timothy to go and see if they're doing okay. Maybe Paul's face was the one that offended uh, those in that city. Maybe Timothy could go in unnoticed a bit. Wow. We can only speculate. And so then after that, Paul goes to Corinth and waits for Timothy to come to him. And what, hap what happens is Timothy arrives to find Paul in Corinth. Now we're in Acts 18. And Paul is overjoyed that the Thessalonians are doing okay. And so he writes First Thessalonians. The only one extra thing I'll say, and let me just turn to the text sure. to find this. Paul actually wants to visit them, right? Mm -hmm. He wants to visit them, but, um, but there's so much trouble that he's not able to do so. We, we can imagine that the trouble is really to do with the persecution. And I'm just going to read a little bit of chapter 2, Brothers, verse, verse 17, 1 Thessalonians 2, 17. Brothers, when we were torn away from you for a short time, in person but not in thought, out of our intense longing we made every effort to see you, for we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan stopped us wow. huh. now here's something interesting as far as i can determine this is the only verse 
in the New Testament to suggest that Satan had some sort of victory wow. against any of the apostles. But here's something even more interesting. What does he do then? What does Paul do? Given that Satan has stopped him going back to Thessalonica, what does he do? Well, we know what he does. He writes an epistle, doesn't he? Which we're reading today, wow. which ended up in the New Testament. So it must be one of Satan's long-lasting regrets that he stopped Paul from returning to Thessalonica because God worked it for good. And now we have the Thessalonian epistles right here wow. in the New Testament. Amen. Amen. That's terrific. So <laughs> this ancient letter, how can it actually be applied to people who live today? Mm. Well, there are a number of things in, in the letter. Um, what we would call the, the occasion behind its writing. Okay. The reason why it was written. And almost all of those are as applicable today as they ever were, or at least they should be. There's a few reasons why Paul writes these letters in no particular order. First of all, they're still going through persecutions. So both in 1 Thessalonians and in 2 Thessalonians, mm -hmm. the theme of persecution mm -hmm. um, appears in both. Um, just looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, um, Right at the very um, beginning, uh, verse 4, really, 2 Thessalonians 1 and 4. Therefore, among God's churches, he writes, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right. And as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. It's not possible really to read the New Testament properly and not understand that God's people regularly suffer. Wow. I might add a rider to that. They suffer when they do Christianity properly, <laughs> <laughs> like these people did here, you know. Right. So I think one of the great examples is probably Peter, uh, who, um, of course, denies the Lord three times. I'm thinking of that particular Peter, my namesake. And it seems like he was willing to love the Lord with all his heart until it was going to get him into trouble. Right. Wow. So as soon as it was going to get him into trouble, mm -hmm. oh, just a moment. I don't know this man, you know. Now, one of the things that happened in the New Testament was early Christians didn't really have that choice. Not really, because many of them were uh, thrown out of the local synagogues. So even, even Paul's Greek converts, many of them were probably synagogue um, attenders, right? And so uh, to be thrown out of the synagogue was to be expelled from the community many times. Mm. It was a real cost to being, you know, to be being baptized. Today, I don't know what it's like in the USA, but in the United Kingdom, when you get baptized, it's followed by cake and <laughs> photographs, okay? And, uh, and, and some fresh clothes. But, but in the New Testament, to be baptized uh, was a public act that severed you often from the community in which you were living. And so, and so God's people were persecuted. And so how does this apply today? I've got about three or four of these. So, so uh, here's the first one. Um, how does this apply today? Well, really, it just inspires me to think, well, Lord, now, look, nobody wants to be persecuted, right? And Paul, we actually mentioned it a moment ago, he fled persecution on one occasion because it got so dangerous for him. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, nevertheless, 
is what I'm preaching being worth persecuted for? Is how I'm living so different, not to make me unpleasant to the world, all right? We're not talking about that. There's plenty of people who are unpleasant and they don't represent Jesus at all. But that my, that my standards and the way that I live my life and the fact that I'm unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, does that get me into trouble sometimes? Or are we really thinking of the Christian faith as a bit more of a pleasure cruiser uh, rather than a lifeboat? Once again, a little reference to something Rainer Bonke might have said, you know. So that's the first thing, really, that, that it began in persecution. And the reason why Paul's letters, First and Second Thessalonians, are full of joy is because although the persecution is still going on, Paul is happy that they are enduring these uh, trials well. And just one more reference. He <laughs> says, does he not? All this is evidence, verse 5 of chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians 1, 5, that God's judgment is right. You are being counted worthy of suffering for the gospel. It shouldn't be a mystery to suffer for the gospel. It should be an honor to suffer for the gospel. Wow. And it's all about how we're seeing this in our mind, isn't it? Hmm. Okay. And another thing that comes out of the Thessalonian epistles is the theme of holy living. Let me turn you back to the first epistle for a minute. And perhaps chapter four is a good place uh, to look. Verse three, how many Christians do we know that want to know God's will. You know, if we were to put on a knowing God's will conference, do you know, do you know it'd be full? Uh, if there was a martyrdom conference next door, not many people in there. <laughs> I, think, I think Dr. Michael Brown used to mention that. <laughs> um, not many people want the gift of martyrdom, do they? And if they do, they can only use it once. But here, verse 3, of 1 Thessalonians 4, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, right? Sanctified. And then he goes on to say exactly what he means. And I'm afraid, yes, he's going to mention sex mm -hmm. and sexual purity straight away. Yeah. Um, it might be worth mentioning that whenever we have an epistle like this, so we're in the Thessalonian epistles, this is a Greek city. And so the Greek cities are made up of Jews and Greeks. Now, if you've ever led anyone to the Lord, uh, uh, it's a bit different to leading someone back to the Lord. So someone who has known the Lord all their life, but backslid or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, when you lead them back, well, it's not so difficult to do. It's, it's quite a simple act to lead someone back to the Lord i.e. they sort of understand, you know, all about it. But when you bring someone to Christ who knows nothing about Christ, which happened to me, by the way, I came to Christ out of atheism when I was 18 years old. And I went from a non-believer one day to radically saved, in the words of Carmen, <laughs> uh, the next day. By the way, back in those days, if you didn't like Carmen, you just weren't a Christian. You were not a Christian if you didn't like Carmen. That was a test of the true Christian faith here in the UK, whether or not you'd heard the champion or not, whether you were addicted to Jesus. Those were the tests of the faith, you know. Anyway, I'm slightly joking, but, but, but only a bit. So I was radically saved. But of course, when I, when I came to Christ, I, I had come out of atheism, so I knew nothing about holy standards. Now, that was 1988. So that's 30 32 years ago, right? Well, what must it be like now? Oh. Can I just urge uh, uh, maybe older Christians who struggle with some of the younger people in their churches? And in the UK, sometimes people say this, well, when I was their age, something, something, something. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, can I just encourage you, you were never their age. <laughs> and I was never their age it's a different world oh. now the greeks were like that they had no they had no morality 
So, so if you're going to win a Jew to Christ, well, he, that Jew would come with sexual ethics, mm -hmm. sense of moral living. Of course, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the Gentiles, let's just say they'd fallen a lot further. So Paul writes here about sexual immorality, mm -hmm. and he wants, to, he wants to address it. I, I want to I say this. What does the, I was, I actually saw something earlier today, Eric, just by sheer chance, mm -hmm. how to fight sexual immorality. I saw like a, I saw like a little booklet thing, how to fight sexual immorality. You know what I thought? I thought this, you can't, you can't fight sexual immorality. What does the Bible say we should do in first Corinthians? Flee sexual immorality. When you flee something, flee the evil desires of youth, Paul will go on to say, I think it's in 2 Timothy, but certainly in 1 Corinthians, it's about sexual immorality. Flee it. When you flee, that means you can't win. And so many of our dear brothers and sisters in Christ are, are falling in the area of sexual immorality because they think they can fight it. Right. You can't fight it. The Bible's clear. You can only flee it. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes out in some of these uh, verses here in First and Second Thessalonians as well. One more thing to do with people's lives mm -hmm. that we read of is the whole issue of laziness. Mm -hmm. Now, this is so odd because, again, I'm speaking to you from Her Majesty's Islands. So I don't know what is preached in the United States, but in, but in Britain, I don't think I ever heard, ever in my life, a sermon about laziness or idleness. I prefer laziness because idle sounds a bit like the worship of idols, right? So, so laziness. Now, laziness... Let's go to 2 Thessalonians 3. 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6. Now, if anyone listening to this has these verses underlined in their Bible, contact me and I will send you a Mars bar as, as a prize. No, 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 forget that. Sunship International will uh, send you a box of free books. <laughs> because I don't think anyone, I think, I think we're on safe ground because I don't think anyone, anyone has these verses underlined in their Bible unless they've underlined nearly everything. Verse 6, 2 Thessalonians 3, hope you're with me. In the name of Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers, to keep away from every brother who is idle and doesn't live according to the teaching you received from us. Wow. Um, now, now he goes on to explain what he, what he means. The actual Greek word, which isn't, isn't really all that helpful here, is a soldier that's out of line. Wow. Now, that might be what we might think it is, but then he goes on to sort of explain. Sometimes it's not the Greek that's helpful, but actually the, 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 the whole passage that, that helps mm. us to um, define a word. Um, for you know how you ought, to, you, you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you. Verse 8, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. Uh, on the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling, so that we wouldn't be a burden to any of you. That's a great verse, by the way, for any modern-day apostle. Don't wait for your denomination to pay for you to do it. You have to go and work yourself. Yeah. That's how that's how apostleship works. You pay the bills. You you hire the hall. You buy the microphone. You know. Anyway, <laughs> let me just get off that. I'm only talking about British apostles now. I'm sure the American ones are great. Um, we did this, he says in verse nine, not because we do not have the right to such help, but but in order to make ourselves a model uh, for you to follow. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. Now, of course, we need to be careful. It doesn't say if a man cannot work, but if a man will not mm. work. And so uh, these, these three areas, I think, are really, really applicable, aren't they, to, to modern life? Mm -hmm. that, that people should 
embrace persecution. Mm -hmm. I mean, no one wants it. No one wants trouble. But if trouble is there, it's actually a sign that we are worthy of the kingdom of God. I remember the great revivalist William Booth. It, it's one of these stories that you never know if it's true or not, but you just hope it is. Uh, someone said that the Salvation Army, as they were preaching in London, I believe it was, in the time of his ministry, some of their workers were, were pelted with eggs. And they went to William Booth and said, they are throwing eggs at us. And William Booth said to them, wear them as medals. <laughs> wear them as medals. And so I want to, so, so it's a challenge. It's a challenge to me. Is what I'm preaching about ever getting me into trouble? Now, I, I know Titus says we're to make the teaching of God our Savior attractive. So we're not looking to be confrontational. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I think, have we watered down the gospel so much that it's not offending anyone anymore? And uh, that's not a sign of our success. I, I must tell you this. I remember two pastors that were talking about their churches. And one of them had a much bigger church than the other. And uh, I said to one of them, I said, so he has a much bigger church than you. And this pastor said, yes, but if he preached the gospel, he wouldn't have. Well, <laughs> I don't know if that was sour grapes or not, but I sort of understood what he meant. Oh. We are not in the book of Numbers. Yeah. We are in the book of Acts. Right. I want to encourage people to flee from sexual immorality. Don't try and fight yeah. sexual urges and pat. Don't fight them. Mm -hmm. Don't fight them. Flee from them taking a leaf out of Joseph's book as when lured into bed by Potiphar's wife did not get out the gospel of John and try to win her to the God of Israel, but rather fled from her bedroom. That's what King David should have done mm -hmm. a long, long, and Samson too, a long, long time ago. And then finally, in terms of, in terms of the way we live our lives, thinking about laziness. Well, mm -hmm. am I lazy? It's, now, we're not talking about works mentality, mm. all right? I love, what, I love some of the things that you've said, and I don't, sometimes I don't know if they're your quotes or people that you're quoting. And now sometimes I'll preach and I'll say things that you've said that other people have said, and people will just tell me how wise I am. I don't like to tell them that's what Eric Gilmore said. And then I don't even know if it's what you said. <laughs> but I love the thing. The only thing that pleases God is what he does himself. You know, so it's it's abiding, isn't it? That and he grows fruit out of us. Even when you were looking at uh, Galatians recently, where it's the fruit of the spirit that you know that is active. So so we're not talking about a works mentality, but perhaps we should be encouraged that to preach the gospel will involve work. There's a great verse, isn't there? First Corinthians fifteen fifty eight. Always give yourselves fully to the work wow. of the Lord wow. because you know that your labor, well, it's the same word work uh -huh. in the Lord is not in vain. Sometimes Christians say, Oh, the, all this preaching, it's, it's, it's like hard work. I think that's exactly what it is. <laughs> it is work. We are, we are called to serve the Lord, aren't we? And so that will sometimes evolve work. Now, in all our discussion here, we haven't even mentioned the second coming, which appears, of course, in First and Second Thessalonians. In First Thessalonians, it's very odd. The the Thessalonians thought that um, thought that they had missed the second coming. Wow. Uh, and in Second Thessalonians, they thought they'd missed the second coming, but for different reasons. In the first epistle, um, people were dying, you know, in the church of old age, of sickness, possibly even of persecution. And, uh, and Paul had preached such a gospel concerning the return of Jesus. Now, uh, what was, what's interesting, First Thessalonians is probably written about 50 AD hmm. for reasons that we don't really have time to go into, but just trust me on this. I have a British accent. It must be true. All right. You know, you know what they do with the British? <laughs> 
some for some reason all the Star Wars villains have got British accents. So I don't know if that makes me a good voice or a bad <laughs> voice, but anyway, trust me on this. So First Thessalonians, probably about 50, 50 AD. And, uh, and Jesus had ascended maybe about 30 AD, something like that. So as we are talking today, we're recording this in, in 2020. So most people who were alive, at least, will remember where they were when 1999 became 2000. It's not all that long ago. I remember where I was. In fact, I remember feeling ill. I thought, wow, this millennium is not looking good for me. I remember feeling ill. I was at a church event thinking, oh, I'm tired. And I, I spent the first three weeks in bed. The first big decision I made in the 21st century was whether to go for McDonald's or KFC. That was my first big call. Now, 20 years is not, is not very long. Just over 20 years ago, I was down at the Brownsville Revival lining up. So it's not all that long ago. And so these people had believed in Thessalonica that Jesus would return. And he hadn't. And then some of them had died. Now, to you and I, that's no problem. We know absent from the body, present with the Lord. Great. Great. People would say, Jesus has got a wonderful plan for your life. He's got an even what, more wonderful plan for your death. You're going to go and be with him. So these people had died. And it, and it shocked the church because they thought that they were lost. And Paul has to say to them in those very famous verses now, no, no, the dead in Christ will rise first. They're going to the front of the line, these people who've died. And then, of course, we won't go into it now, but of course, in, in 2 Thessalonians, you have a report that's reached them, some sort of strange or dodgy prophecy or teaching, wow. chapter 2, that the day of the Lord had already come. Wow. And so Paul has to... So in 1 Thessalonians, they were worried that the dead had missed the second coming. In 2 Thessalonians, they were worried that the living had missed the second coming. And that's why we think, by the way, that these two epistles were probably written about six months apart. So they're probably written at the same time in Corinth, in Acts 18, while Paul is at Corinth for about 18 months. That's probably where he wrote these um, epistles. And uh, because they both deal with the second coming and with laziness, and with persecution, it seems like they, anyway, scholars have speculated, and I wouldn't want to, I, I wouldn't want to disagree, that they're probably written very, very closely together, maybe six months apart, something like that. So yeah, there's a lot in them, isn't there? They're yeah. wonderful, wonderful epistles. So you've dedicated a lot of time to looking into these epistles, yeah? I have, yeah. What, what, what is it that really ministers to you personally from this? What's your favorite thing about these? Episodes? Oh, man, man, man. I'm so glad you asked me that. No, there, there is a stunning verse and a half at the end of chapter one of First, First Thessalonians that I absolutely love. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Um, First Thessalonians chapter one is, is sort of about the gospel. Now, one of my great passions is the gospel itself. And I used to teach classes on this here in Bible school and um, really just to help evangelists to know, well, are they preaching the same thing that Paul preached, right? Because if we're not preaching the original gospel, then we're not going to get original results. The power of the Holy Spirit accompanies the original gospel, not some, not some 21st century version of it. So how are we going to know what the, what the gospel is? Well, we, we're going to go into the Bible. We're going to look at it. We're going to look for it in the text. So one of the ways to discover what the original gospel is, is to look at Acts where there's, well, there are a number of speeches in Acts, gospel sermons, seven or eight of them. Depends how you classify them. 
So certainly, certainly seven or eight of them. And you look at the content of what Peter and Paul preached. What did they actually preach when they preached the gospel? Now, sometimes, <coughs> excuse me, sometimes there's like a context to it. So Paul is a little different when he's with the Greeks in Athens than he is when he's with the Jews. So one of my all-time things is we're preaching Acts 2 messages often to Acts 17 audiences. Mm. Acts 17 is a, is a, is a Greek uh, non, non-Bible audience. And for as long as we're preaching Acts 2 messages to them, they're not going to respond. And so anyway, that's, that's, that's another subject for another time. When we look at 1 Thessalonians, Paul just casually tells us the gospel message that he preached. So it's so, it's so exciting. It burns like a fire in me, this. Look at this. This will be worth paying your internet bill for the whole year just to hear this. If you're listening to this on an iPhone, this is worth the price of that iPhone just to hear this. They tell, this is the middle of verse 9, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, middle of verse 9. They tell how you turned to God. So you understand what we're looking for? We're looking for the gospel. This is what they say. You turned to God from idols. Now, remember, Thessalonica is a Greek city. So Jews don't worship idols, but Greeks did. So by and large, our converts today are Gentiles rather than Jews. So, so this is, you know, I mean, I know different people will, will hear this. Some will have ministry to the Jewish world, but by and large, many of the people listening to us will be ministering to Western, uh, you know, people that are, that are of the Gentile world rather than the Jewish world. So they tell how you turn to God from idols to serve. So not, not accept into your heart. Yes. (laughs) To serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. We noted in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 that Jesus didn't rescue them from persecutions or troubles. In fact, Paul goes on to say in 2 Thessalonians 1 that Jesus will rescue them from tribulations when he returns oh. and not before. Wow. Wow. But here, he rescues his people from the coming wrath. So just in those verses, can you see, Eric, so much of the gospel, the original, early, allow me to say primitive gospel, primitive not meaning Uh, anything wrong, but meaning right at the root of it. And this is the gospel, to turn to God from idols, from the things that are in our lives. We have to change, don't we? Gentiles have to change. Mm -hmm. Um, I heard heard someone say the other day, you know, come down the front and receive Jesus. It'll just take five minutes. It won't take five minutes. It's going to take the rest of your life. I need to turn the microphone down, right? You turn to God from idols to serve. We're not giving Jesus a go, not trying out Christianity, not seeing if God has got a wonderful plan for my life. That's not what's going on here. We serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. A longing to be with the son of God is in the original gospel. To wait for his son from heaven. Notice, Eric, not to wait for heaven. To wait for his son from heaven. Praise God. You can tell where a Christian's eyes are at, the way they talk about heaven. Mm -hmm. 
if a Christian thinks heaven is a place, then they're getting there. They're, they're really getting it wrong, aren't they? Mm -hmm. It's not a place. Yeah. It's a person. Yes. Who happens to live in a place. Yeah. <laughs> People talk about, oh, I can't wait to go to heaven because, oh, I won't have to pay any bills and my legs will work again. And, and uh, that's true. But I don't know about you. I'm waiting for his son. I'm not waiting for heaven. I'm not waiting to dance on the streets that are golden, although I will. And I'll be a lot slimmer in heaven, you know. No, I'm waiting for his son from heaven. Jesus. Yes. Whom he raised from the dead. Yes. Who rescues us from the coming wrath. So let me finish with this. There's a little verse in the book of Acts that talks about someone called Gallio. Hmm. It's the kind of verse that no one really notices. And it's when Paul is in Corinth. So this is going to be in Acts 18. Okay. And it says, while Gallio was the proconsul of Achaia, this and this, such and such a thing happened. Now, that's sometimes what we call Bible filler. People just read that. No one's got that underlined in their Bible. No one's got that on a T-shirt. While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia. No one's made a song about that. But here's the thing. We know when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, because that's a historical reference. The Emperor Claudius wrote an inscription to his friend, Gallio. It's at the temple at Adelphi, or at the Delphic Oracle, if you like. That still exists today. If, if anyone wants to Google Gallio and inscription, you'll see a Google image of that. It still exists now. Now, Gallio was the proconsul of Achaia, no later than 51, 52 AD because that's when Claudius was the emperor. Which means that when Paul was in Corinth, that means he was in Corinth around about 50 AD, which means that he wrote 1 Thessalonians around about 50 AD, which makes it perhaps with some possible contest with Galatians but it makes it very possibly the earliest piece of the New Testament ever written. First Thessalonians. So when we read that verse that, that shares the gospel, we're reading the very first time, perhaps, and when I'm saying perhaps, I mean most likely, mm -hmm. the very first time the gospel was ever written down. Wow. So that is a very precious piece of the New Testament. And an inspiration to me that I must preach the same thing mm. that Paul preached. Turn to God. Yeah. Serve God. Turn from your idols. Jesus will rescue us from hell and the coming wrath of God. But we are to wait for his glorious, beautiful, wonderful son from heaven. Yeah, that's why, Eric, it's special to me. Yeah. So people that are listening to this could be at work right now, maybe driving down the road. Maybe there's a woman washing dishes right now and she's got her AirPods in listening to you. Mm. Use the letters to the Thessalonians and, and speak to them. Mm. Well, I'd say one of the things that's really clear in these letters is that Jesus is coming again. Mm. And, uh, I, I know that sometimes today there are some Christians who if Jesus really did come again, they'd actually be quite annoyed because they've got all sorts of plans. I have no plans, have you, but to wait for his son from heaven. So I want to encourage people washing dishes that Jesus is going to come again. And while we've thought in these epistles about those persecutions the fact that the, the letters are about persecutions, but also strongly emphasizing the return of Jesus means this, that all these troubles will soon be gone. Wow. Paul says, doesn't he, I consider 
that are, you know that the troubles we have now are momentary yeah. they're not worthy not worthy to be considered and brought in any way comparable to the glory that will be revealed in us to anyone else washing the dishes let me encourage you with this that sexual immorality is not some insignificant thing it is a real thing uh-huh. and i've been a pastor since well since the 90s and so i also know it's not just an issue for men uh-huh. i know it's an issue for men and women and i want to encourage a fresh desire in people's hearts to be as sexually pure as they can be wow. and that involves fleeing not fighting mm-hmm. and for anyone who is doing the dishes well you can rejoice because at least those verses about being lazy in Thessalonians probably don't apply to you <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay to work hard it's okay to work hard and and god's blessing is upon those who work hard paul said that we worked hard among you to be an example to you and so we should we should we should keep going the lord will return and he says in first thessalonians 5 that his coming will be like a thief in the night well then he goes on to say but you brothers are living in the light so when he talks about a thief in the night he means that it will be sudden no one expects a burglar or someone to break in so it is true that no man knoweth the hour but actually we are expected to know the season of the coming of the lord that's what second thessalonians 2 is all about giving us one or two clues in fact the bible is full of clues as to the kinds of things we are to expect as the coming of the lord draws near and so i want to encourage us wherever we are at in all our fatigue and in all our suffering and in all our difficulty he is coming soon and we should wait for his son from heaven may the lord bless everyone listening to us today with that well i i thank you so much for coming on oh it's been great mate been it's great. really it's been fantastic for me and i'm going to put it up on podcast i'll send you a link and uh, i love you so much and i thank you so much for your relationship and and believing no, in me you, and and it just our relationship is great to me thank no, you no you i mean your ministry has changed my life I mean, you are the one who um you kind of bucked the trend cuz normally when i i used to say to the students you know most people are affected by people and not by sermons mm-hmm. so i'd say so you know think of five sermons that have changed your life most people can't think of any think of five people that you oh i i i think of 10 people 50 people that changed my life but your ministry changed my life it brought me back wow. really to a uh, a sense of uh, not needing to do anything mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. just to be with him yes and it's that is that's an unfathomable change that your ministry made when you when you came to england and you were brought up to some very small church in the middle of yorkshire you must have traveled for hours in a car from london to come to a small church and i bought uh enjoying the gospel that night in fact i think you'd packed up the books by the time i'd finished with the lord and i had to re- wrestle it out of the car <laughs> but that that very simple book changed i i i must go and you must go but i i i changed from telling god how thirsty and hungry i was mm. to sitting down and eating and drinking wow. it was as clear as that praise god and because i was lecturing at that time and i had pastoral care of all the students then we would have kind of eric gilmore evenings <laughs> where i would steal all your material so you can steal anything of mine because i'll still be in your debt for a long time there's nothing you can steal that i still won't know you <laughs> and um so we used to have evenings of sharing and uh i i used to preach about you know john 6 and stuff that i hadn't really preached on for years mm-hmm. you know 
and, I and all it, no. coming out of just that little book, enjoying the gospel that I read and read and read. Mm-hmm. And, um, it really impacted me, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, so I will forever in, uh, I don't know who I could say this to more than you mm-hmm. for the whole of eternity. I will be in your debt. Ah. I mean that. That means a lot to me. Thank you so much. I mean that. But it's true. (laughs) It's true. It's true. Uh, He's good to us, huh? He really is.